Good morning, friends. Welcome to Friendship Church. Thank you for joining us via the internet or via YouTube. Thank you for tuning our way. We're thrilled to have you. Today is going to be communion as part of our service today. So if you haven't prepared already, I would ask you to take a few moments and acquire juice or wine, bread, cracker, whatever is your custom, and just be prepared for that after the worship service today because we want you to be a part of sharing around the table of the Lord with us. Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to ask God to bless our time together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grandeur, for your beauty, for your wonder, for your creation, and for your salvation salvation through Jesus Christ, your incredible gift to our lives. We've come to celebrate all of that today, so receive us as we come, as we sing, as we testify of your goodness, as we read your word, as we hear the message of the gospel, challenge our hearts, change our lives. We thank you for all this. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Today, we celebrate the second Sunday in our Advent season. Today, we focus on the angels. The first scripture is from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The second reading is from the New Testament, the book of Luke, Chapter 1, verses 26 through 33. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Would you join me in prayer? Our Father, gracious and kind, Receive us as we come into your presence today through your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We bless you for all that you are, for all that you have given, and for all that you've promised. Thank you for all your creation, the things we enjoy here on earth, the things we admire in the sky, and the things that exist in the heavenly realm that we only read about in scriptures. We give thanks for the angels who serve and worship you day and night. But we also thank you for those who have been assigned to watch over us and care for us without our awareness of their presence. We know that the word for angel in scripture also means messenger. And we give thanks today for the messengers of the good news that declare your message and love every day, both here and abroad. Bless them, we pray, and may many hear and receive the message that your messengers deliver. In the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Good morning, everyone, and a blessed 
Advent Sunday to you at Friendship Church. And this is indeed the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And now, some announcements. First of all, this afternoon at 3 p.m., we are having a memorial candle lighting service. And this is an opportunity for you to remember and honor someone you love who has passed away. So to be part of this, please email the church office with your name, the name of the person who has passed when they passed away, and a brief statement about your relationship with them. And also, you can join us online live via Zoom at 3 p.m. and share as well. You've received the link for Zoom in your email. It is also in the focus. And then we are having a Friendship Women's Christmas Party this coming Wednesday on the 9th of December from 9 to 1030. And this is going to be an amazing time. It's going to be live online via Zoom. And we have so much planned, and you can even come at 8.30 for fellowship before we actually begin at 9. But there are going to be testimonies, there are going to be devotion, there's going to be scripture, music, and it's just going to be a powerful time, so don't miss it. And the link is in the focus and also in the email that goes out to everyone. Now, a word about our Thanksgiving offering. And wait until you hear this. To date, our congregation has given $26,487. Isn't that exciting? And this is going to be equally divided between the Coachella Valley Rescue Mission and also King's School. And just a note, if you still want to participate, please mark your giving as Thanksgiving offering. And then also, our congregation has given nearly $5,000 to the book drive in conjunction with the Read With Me program. Isn't that totally awesome? The Lord is using Friendship Church in amazing ways in the lives of thousands upon thousands of people. Finally, just a quick word about Pastor Jim. Just wanted you to know he is continuing to recover from the COVID virus and let us all keep him in our prayers. And now I want to give you one of my favorite verses to hold on to today. It's a great verse of hope. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Once in royal David city stood a lonely cattle shed where a mother lay What 
child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch our keeping this this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and angels sing haste haste to bring him Lord the babe the son of Mary why lies he in such mean estate where ox and ass are feeding good Christian fear for sinners here the silent word is pleading yes this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and angels sing Son of Mary, so bring him incense, gold, and myrrh. Come, peasant king, to own him, the king of kings. Salvation brings. Let loving hearts enthrone him. Son of Mary. I don't know if you have favorite Christmas songs. I think we all do, some of them. And some of these might be brand new to you, but they're wonderful, wonderful songs. Let's sing this next one together. Infant holy, infant lowly, for his bed a cattle stall, oxen lowing. Little knowing, Christ the babe is Lord of all. Swift are ringing, angels singing, Noel's ringing, tidings bringing. Christ the babe is Lord of all. Christ the babe is Lord of all. Flocks were sleeping, shepherds keeping vigil too. Saw the glory, heard the story, tidings of the gospel true. Thus rejoicing, free from sorrow, praises voicing, greet the morrow. Christ the babe was born for you. Christ the babe was born for you. Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home was there found no room for thy holy nativity. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart. For thee, heaven's arches rang when the angels sang, proclaiming thy royal decree. But of lowly birth didst thou come to earth, and in great humility. Oh, come to my heart. In my heart for thee. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. And into my heart, into my heart, come in. 
And now it is our great joy to celebrate the Lord's Supper, or communion as we call it. And I want to read from 1 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our hearts are filled with thanksgiving for all that you have done for us and especially for dying on the cross for our sins and making it possible for us to have a forever relationship with you and have the hope of eternal life. And now, Lord, will you bless this time of mm -hmm. communion that we here at Friendship Church have with you. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, mm. which is for you. Thank you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Pastor Catherine. As we think of the cup, I'm reminded of uh, so many opportunities to use a cup and how it's um, so often just for a moment and, and then disposed of. But this cup, not specifically this piece of plastic, but the symbol of this cup is eternal. It's not something we dispose of. It's something that has changed our lives. The shed blood of Jesus Christ. How grateful we are for the covenant it represents with us for all of eternity. And so in remembering our Savior, Jesus Christ, we drink together the cup. Let's do so. Would you take a moment right there in your home and give the Lord thanks for what he's done for you?
Thanks, Steve. So great to hear you, and what a perfect song. Angels We Have Heard on High is a favorite Christmas carol. Obviously, it addresses that uh, angelic host that appeared in the sky on that, uh, well, indescript night, if you will, for those shepherds who were probably gathered around the fire to get a good night's sleep, suddenly interrupted by the message that a baby had been born in Bethlehem. But angels were well, throughout the entire story, as it unfolds of that blessed first Christmas. But angels were a part of many things that took place in the Bible, and we're going to review some of those today. Now, as we consider the role of angels, uh, the theme of our second week of Advent, I want to encourage you to open your heart and your mind to what the Holy Spirit might want to say to you today, not only about the role that the angels played, but how that might translate into the lives of you and me today as we just allow the Holy Spirit to have His way, His voice speaking into our lives. Now, even a casual reading of the Christmas story brings these angels to the front and center. Last week, we spoke of the angels that appeared to Joseph and Mary that kind of served as prophets as they declared what God was planning to do and how He desired them to participate in the same. However, angels go back far beyond the first advent. I take you back to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, and the second chapter, the very first verse. This is what it reads. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their host. Now read the word host here. It refers to the heavenly or angelic host that is in heaven. What a remarkable scene for us to imagine. And again, it reflects back on this scene that the angels presented to the shepherds as they performed this backup choir, if you will, to the messenger who declared the birth of the baby in Bethlehem. The angelic host, as it's described in the Bible, is made up of three elements, the cherubim, the seraphim, and the living creatures. We hear this described in the vision that was given to Ezekiel in the Old Testament, but also the revelation, the very last book of the Bible, given to John the apostle on the Isle of Patmos. Now, these creatures are always worshiping God. So that sounds like a good place for us to start today. Angels are worshipers of God. I take you to the Old Testament book of Isaiah, another vision that was given to this Old Testament prophet. In the year King Uzziah died, it reads in the sixth chapter, which was 739 BC, by the way. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood before him, each having six wings, and two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. I jump now all the way to the end of the Bible, to the book of Revelation, and from chapter 4 I read, and the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, and are full of eyes around and without. The day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And as you read the Revelation, you read this continuous outpouring of worship and praise to God by all of this angelic host. But can I say to you, whether it's the 8th century B.C., or that which is still in advance for us, leading into eternity. There is constant praise and worship before the Lord. And sometimes I think when we pray the Lord's Prayer and we say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, since there's constant worship before the Lord in heaven, well, maybe, just maybe, we should consider a little bit more of that here on this earth. My, how that would change the environment of our planet, to say the least. Well, you might remember an angel by the name of uh, Beelzebul. Um, he decided that even though he was created to worship God, that he wasn't going to do that. Instead, he was going to focus on making himself equal with God. He deceived himself into thinking that he didn't need God. In fact, he could become just like God. Well, we know where that got him, don't we? Today, we call him Satan or the devil. Lesson learned. Angels were created to worship God. But that's not all. Angels are messengers of God. Now, possibly you recall the reference we made last week to the story of Abraham and Sarah as they had patiently, well, or impatiently, waited for God to fulfill his promise of a son that would eventually become a great nation. We know it today as the nation of Israel. 
And you remember how that they waited and then at the Oaks of Mamre on a particular night and particular occasion, two messengers, two angels showed up to tell Abraham that this time next year, he and his wife, Sarah, were going to enjoy a bouncing baby boy. Well, the word there for those messengers or angels in the Hebrew is malak. It means literally angel. In the New Testament, when we turn and we read of angels, the word there is aglios. Aglios can be translated angel or messenger or envoy. And in some occasions, it's translated pastor. Your pastor is an angel. That's a scary thought, isn't it? Now, this is really applicable when you think of the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Because in each one of those, you say, to the angel of the church, it's to the pastor of the church. Just a frame of reference. Now, we find it out throughout Scripture that God sent angels to convey messages to individuals or to groups of people. I mentioned Abraham earlier. I'm thinking of another story from that same setting in the 21st chapter of Genesis. You remember that um, Sarah was a little impatient with God fulfilling his plan, and so she thought she would help him out a little bit. Can I just tell you, beware of trying to help God do his business, okay? (laughs) If he tells you to do something, that's fine, but don't do something he doesn't tell you to do. She offered to Abraham her maidservant, Hagar, and said, well, you know, maybe you could... uh, Uh, have a son with her, and this would help God fulfill the promise. Well, it happened, and Ishmael was the product. And of course, after Ishmael was born, and she saw the attention Abraham was given to Hagar and Ishmael, she wasn't going to have that, so she sent Hagar packing. Well, as Hagar and her young son headed out into the desert, without provision, without companionship, God sent an angel to her to give her a message. And the message, without reading it to you, was he would not abandon her, He was going to care for her and her child. She need not be afraid. Undoubtedly, you're thinking of other stories throughout the entire Old Testament of places and moments in which God sent an angel, his messenger, to that individual or that group of people. Many, many, many stories. But I jump forward to the nativity. This is the focus of our season and of our day. And of course, you remember this story kind of begins with the birth of John the Baptist. His father, who was a priest in the temple, taking care of his daily functions and responsibilities, suddenly is interrupted by an appearance of a heavenly being. It appears just to the right of the altar of incense, which is very near to the entrance of the Holy of Holies. And he's startled. He's he's frightened. And the angel assures him that there's no reason for him to be afraid that God has come to bless him and his wife, Elizabeth. He's going to give him a son. They're going to name him John. He's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. Wonderful, wonderful story. And then, of course, you remember, as we read last week, and as it was read to us at the beginning of our service today, an angel appeared to Mary. You know that story. An angel also appeared to Joseph and told him what God was doing and what he needed to do. But then Angel also showed up to announce to that group of shepherds that we referred to earlier, announcing to them the baby born in Bethlehem. And of course, that angelic choir that backed up the announcement. What a marvelous thing. I read to to you from Luke chapter 2. And in the same region, referring to the area around Bethlehem, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. Now, as I thought about these um, visitations by heavenly beings, I was captivated by the singular commonality, and that is that each of the people that received the visit were afraid. That was their initial reaction, fear. And I wondered about that. Why would be afraid of an angel? Well, I don't suppose that we expect the appearance of a heavenly being in any one of our given days in any given time, I don't guess. You know, they, they, they seem to be out of sync. And of course, when they speak a declaration from God, that kind of nervous, I suppose, because we're not used to necessarily hearing that every day. And when we think of angels, and we, we probably think of a creature that primarily male, dressed in white, with wings. I suppose that's the image we have. 
Though we all know from watching television, this pro program touched by an angel, or if you've watched the Christmas music movies like um, A Wonderful Life or Preacher's Wife, we know that those angels were not dressed in white and didn't have wings, okay? That brings a thought to mind. In the book of Hebrews, there's an interesting passage of scripture that comes to mind right here in the message. It reads, let love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. King James reads, angels unaware. That's kind of an interesting thought for us. Can angels be involved in our lives at times and we're not even aware they're present? Wow. I want to share with you a personal story from our previous ministry in Oregon. A story that truly took place, that impacted my life dramatically. Our church was growing and we were trying to facilitate more people coming to our church. We added a Saturday night service, trying to reach people maybe who worked on Sundays or had other obligations or involvements on the first day of the week. We held it in the youth center of our facility because it was a little smaller uh, room other than having a small group of people in our sanctuary that held about 1,200 people. As I gathered with the worship team just before starting that Saturday night service, we were preparing, going through the service schedule and asking God to help us when Julia ran in and said, Pastor Lou, Pastor Lou, Joe just fell out of his chair. Joe was a beloved member of our congregation, a little short, heavy set Italian man that carried gum in his pocket for all the kids. He was dearly loved. As I ran into the uh, youth center, I found Joe laying on the floor next to a chair and it didn't look good. Uh, I rolled him over and began to assess his condition. Now, not every year, but on a regular rotation, we had people come in and train our staff and our lead volunteers with first aid and CPR because we just needed to be available and helpful to people who may have need. Now, we have a lot of doctors and a lot of nurses in our congregation, but we couldn't always expect them to be present to help us. And so we tried to prepare ourselves. So having noticed that Joe was not breathing, I began to do CPR. Suddenly, a gentleman appeared just above me, tall, about 30, I would suppose, and said, can I help? And I said, absolutely, do you know CPR? And he said, I'm a nurse and I've been called in for special duty here at the hospital. I said, well, what would you like me to do? He said, looks like you know what you're doing. You go ahead and start and I'll assist you. So I began chest compressions and he began alternating with me, mouth to mouth breathing. Time passed, obviously 911 uh, had been called and, and they were on their way, but I think it was some 10 to 15 minutes. It seemed like forever. And we continued to try to revive Joe and do what we could to help him. Well, soon they arrived and obviously we stood back and let them do their duties as they did everything and attached everything and put him on a gurney and loaded him into the ambulance. One of my associates was there with me that night. I never made it mandatory that the associates come on Saturday night because we had multiple services on Sunday. And he said to me, Pastor Lou, what are you going to do? Are you going to dismiss service? And I kind of smiled and said, no way. Can you imagine that? I'm going to have absolute attention at the sermon today. <laughs> Forgive me for that. I asked him to go with uh, Ruth, Joe's wife, to the hospital and pray with her, support her, and keep us informed of how Joe was doing. He did. As we began the service, I looked around for that tall, young man, who said he was a nurse, couldn't find him. No one ever saw him come in the building. No one ever saw him leave. Now, I made hospital calls on quite a regular basis, and our senior associate, Pastor Myers, was there every single day. Neither of us ever saw that man in the hospital. We never saw him again in town. We've never known who he was or exactly why he was there. Now, sad to say, Joe died that night. But can I tell you that Ruth was very grateful 
for the intervention that immediately came to try to save her husband before the paramedics arrived. I don't know what we were able actually to produce, but I know without a doubt that that night we had a visitation from an angel. I just believe that God does that. I believe that he performs those kinds of things for us. Yet I realize that many times when angels appear like they did to Mary and Joseph and the shepherds, it can be startling because they were not expected. They, they were people that were out of the norm in their lives, that had a message for the moment, had a job that God sovereignly had assigned them to do. So angels are worshipers of God and angels are messengers of God. But I want to suggest that angels are also guardians of what's important to God. Let me give you some scriptures that I think you'll find familiar. First from Psalm 34 verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. These words are familiar to you, I know. Psalm 91 verse 11. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Now, from the story of Daniel, I read you Daniel's words that he spoke to King Darius once he had been delivered, if you will, from the lion's den. Quote, My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they could not harm me, inasmuch as I was found innocent before him, and also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. Another story comes to mind, this time from Acts chapter 12. Maybe you remember the story of Peter being thrown into prison. It followed a rather uh, ugly event. King Herod had arrested James, the brother of John. They were called the sons of Zebedee, or Jesus called them the sons of thunder. James was arrested and he was then beheaded, executed. It pleased some of the people. Herod liked that, being the politician that he was. And so he arrested Peter and had the same plan for him. But a group of people were praying that God would spare Peter's life. Well, that night, I read to you from this 12th chapter of Acts, that night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between the two soldiers bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter's side and roused him, saying, Get up quickly! And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals. He did so. And he said to him, Wrap a cloak around you and follow me. It's an incredible story. <laughs> so Peter, probably dazed and somewhat surprised, follows this angel, and they end up at the house of Mary, who's the mother of John Mark. You remember that individual in Scripture, I'm quite sure. As they reach the door, and I can just kind of picture Peter rapping on the door, Rhoda, the servant, goes and sees and recognizes it's Peter. Well, she doesn't grant him entrance. She is so excited, she runs back into the rest of the house where people are praying and announces, Peter's outside! Well, these mighty prayer warriors, so filled with faith and confidence in God, said to her, you're out of your mind. Well, she insisted, no, Peter's out there. And they responded, it's just his angel. You can read it, Acts chapter 12. Well, truly an angel had been involved, intervened, had uh, helped Peter escape and lead him to this particular residence, but it was actually Peter at the door. I love the story. Now, let me pause here and address something that I think some people are probably thinking and wondering about, and appropriately so. You're asking, Pastor Lou, how come God intervened and saved Peter, but he didn't intervene and save James? It's a great question, and I'd like to have a perfect answer for you, but I don't, but I do have an opinion. You see, God has an entire movie from beginning to end of all of life. You and I are limited to holding a few snapshots, and that's all we have. And we're trying to make sense of it all from a very limited perspective. You see, we have no idea what might have happened to James if he had not died in that moment in time. 
Now, I'm not trying to be a fatalist. It's just a reality we have to consider. We have no idea what the impact of that ugly, cruel death had on the Jewish community, on the newly formed Christian church, and on the rest of the disciples. We know about Peter's life and his ministry following that moment and how God preserved that and spared that and anointed and blessed that. But did that mean Peter was more important than James? No, 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 no. Don't go there. You see, in the economy of eternity, God values things differently than we do. The Bible says that precious are the death of his one, godly ones. And so even the death of his people is extremely important to God. And so I want, you, I want to assure you that James's death was important to our Heavenly Father. But maybe in the economy of heaven, it was more important than him staying alive. I can't explain that to you, but I have to believe that's a possibility. On the other hand, there was something other for Peter to do. And God protected, if you will. He guarded what he deemed most important. Now, in, in considering that, I just have to say to you that I've done a lot of reading about angels in our day and time and encounters that people have had with them. I, I want to share just one of the stories that I found with you today, if I may. Forgive me for just reading it verbatim. Since sunup, I've been on the Missouri River riding around in my 14-foot aluminum boat. The river was running high and fast, swollen with fallen fall rains. Lots of debris floated by, mainly branches from the willow trees that grew along the shore. Every once in a while, an entangled mess would come my way and I'd have to maneuver around it, but I was used to the outdoors and to adventures in small boats, single engine planes, hiking in nature. I liked excitement, and I liked that God always made sure I came home safe. This evening, I would thank him properly over a fresh duck dinner with my wife. As I motored along, the sun was high in a bright blue sky. A raccoon at the water's edge took a little dip. A doe slipped quickly, silently through the trees. Nature was abundantly on display, but I had not come across one boat that entire day. The call startled me. Who had snuck up on my boat like that? I turned around and looked in every direction. Hunters don't play games. There was no one out there on the river, no one but me, just as I had suspected. But still, I could have sworn I heard my name called clear as day. This time, the call came with more urgency. It was a warning, unmistakably. I jerked around to look over my shoulder. Whoa! An enormous log barreled straight at me. I turned the motor, swerved my little boat out of its path. Seconds later, it passed by me. The log must have been 20 feet or more in length and about three feet in diameter. Probably washed away from a lodging somewhere up river. About 100 yards downstream was an empty steel barge moored along the shore. The log hit the barge so hard and so fast that the barge was launched into the air before finally falling back into the water. That could have been me. I could barely catch my breath. My hands were shaking so hard I couldn't hold on to the motor. If it hadn't moved out of the, if I hadn't moved out of the path of that log, I would have been dead. That night when I got home from my latest adventure, I had more than our dinner to thank the Lord for. I heard an angel out there on the river today, I told my wife. He called my name and saved my life. Yes, I do believe in those kinds of encounters, not only because of what I read in scripture, but because of what I continually hear people convey, stories I've read, books that have come my way of people who've had that kind of encounter with a heavenly being, God guarding what was most important to him. I think that that guarding, that stewardship, that sense of treasure in our earth takes on multiple forms. I think it includes the church. 
I think God has angels that guard the church, that guard his word. Yes, as precious as it is, they've tried to destroy it multiple times throughout the history that we have contained for us. The integrity of the gospel, I think that's being guarded. All the ministries that are represented around our world, I choose to believe that God has assigned angels to help and protect and guard them as well. That also includes you because you're important to God. And who knows how many angels are assigned to you every single day. I think God has several for me because I'm probably <laughs> an accident looking for a place to happen. He needs lots of help with me, okay? Well, this Christmas time is such a marvelous time of year. I absolutely love it. I think you do as well. And as we're getting into the month of December, we're probably feeling, feeling more like it. Maybe your tree is up. Maybe the wreath is on the door, lights outside. And, and I, I trust you're beginning to feel, pick up the spirit of this thing, okay? In spite of everything that's out there, we need to enjoy a little Christmas. Well, this was such an inspiring and remarkable story that comes to us of a tiny baby being born in Bethlehem that literally changed the world. You know, there were so few that even noticed it taking place. Just a handful. So many people being captured by their own schedules and their own desires and their own plans. They, they had no idea what was happening in that manger, in that simple stable outside of Bethlehem. And the few that came, well, primarily they were invited by angels. That's right. I'd like to ask if you've ever thought about being an angel. Have you ever wanted to be an angel? <laughs> well, I want to suggest you have a chance to be one. That's right. As angels are worshipers of God, I want to implore you to become a worshiper of God. Not just by attending some church service or some concert where worship and praise is taking place, but you personally be engaged in worshiping and honoring God on a daily basis, whether you're in church or at home, wherever you are, that that becomes a norm of your life, but not only an expression from your lips, but literally your entire life brings worship and honor to God. Be an angel. Secondly, I want to suggest that you become a, a messenger of God. That's right. I don't know there's ever been a day or a time when the good news is more needed, when people are more desperate for hope and for help than people are today. Not just some other place in some other country, but in your neighborhood. The people among whom you live, your neighbors, not just by declaring what you've memorized in Scripture or not just repeating what the pastor said on Sunday morning, but telling your own story, living your own life, emulating the Christ that you've come to know. Be an angel, a messenger of God. And finally, let me suggest that we all become guardians of what's important to God. And again, that includes His church. And we pray for the reopening of that. My, how we need it. For the integrity of the gospel in our world today. That God would honor his word among us today. That God would bless all those ministries that are out there, here, there, and everywhere. Those we support, those we do not. That God would honor and protect and guard them against assault and against danger. And that God would guard and protect what's most important to him, and that's people, every person. And dare I include even the unborn person. They're all important to God. And thank God for angels from on high, but thank God for angels not so much on high, but right here on earth, including you. Thanks for being an angel. Let's pray. Father, how grateful we are for all that we've experienced today. Christmas songs, communion, the reading of Old Testament, new prayers prayed, and now consideration of your word and its 
application to our personal lives, how grateful we are, how thankful we are that the book is not some antiquated piece of literature, but it's a living word that speaks to our lives every day, giving assurance and guidance and help and comfort. Whatever we need, we can find in your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that illuminates it to our hearts and our minds. Thank you for what we've come to know even today in this time together. Now, Lord, help us to be your angels. Oh, not that heavenly host that's serving you constantly, obedient to you, but may we become like them, Lord, obedient to you, serving you here on this planet, in our own realm, in our own capabilities and talents and, and, and relationships, being your angels, worshipers of God, messengers of God, guarding what's important to you. And for those who are viewing today that have never come to know you, Lord, just assure them that you're waiting for them to open their heart and ask you to come in, that your son will save them from their sins and change them for all of eternity. They can truly know the power and meaning of Christmas. Lord, let that Christmas spirit begin to well up within us. Let us not wait till Christmas Eve, Lord, but let us know even today the reality and beauty of what you desire for us to know. We thank you for this in your wonderful name. And now we join together our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power forever and ever. Amen. And now, may the peace of God our Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship and power of his Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Let's sing, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. God bless you all. Joy to the world. Merry Christmas. <laughs>